Well, hi everyone, this is Bob the Science Guy. You know, everybody seemed to have liked that video I put out the other day concerning Dave Weiss and his misunderstanding of orbits and his argument with ChatGPT. But a couple of people did mention that they wanted to get a little bit more into the physics. So I thought I'd take a moment and just talk a little bit about some terms and how we look at things in the physical world. Now you may recall when I talked about the International Space Station, which is in orbit around the Earth at about 420 kilometers above the surface and about 7.64 kilometers per second. And I discussed its orbit in reference to the force of gravity accelerating it towards the center of the Earth and centrifugal force balancing that acceleration in the opposite direction. And some people wanted to talk a little bit more about acceleration and things like scalars and vectors. So let's go ahead and have a look at those. So here we have a pretty classic kinematic equation in physics. This is the displacement or the distance formula. So let's kind of go over this equation a little bit. The distance that an object travels is related to its starting position, its starting velocity times the time that it travels, and then this term, which relates uh, the time to acceleration, and it's something that you add to the starting velocity. But let's have a look at this from a physics standpoint. What is this distance? Well, there's two terms that we use for moving something from point A to point B. The first is the distance that it travels, and the second is called the displacement. Now, distance is a scalar value, and displacement is a vector. What's the difference between a scalar and a vector? Well, both contain a quantity called magnitude. That just means how far something is. The difference between distance and displacement is that it also contains magnitude, but it has direction. So if I start with a graph and a point at the origin of the graph, which is this dot right here, and I tell you that I travel a distance of three units from that point, what am I saying? Well, uh, I could be moving in this direction, or I could be moving in that direction, or I could be moving in that direction, or this one. And what I'm going to end up with is a circle. Kind of looks like that. And I could be anywhere on the point of that circle. That is the distance, because it is a distance of three units from the origin. However, if I want to talk about a vector, I talk about displacement. So I say that I travel three units in that direction, and that means that I am now right there. Now we have the same issue when it comes to speed versus velocity. Speed just means that you're going back and forth. It's just movement in any particular direction. Velocity means that you started here, and you ended up here, and you covered this displacement in x units of time. It doesn't necessarily relate to how far you really traveled. It's just the time it took you to get from point A to point B. So for example, if you're running around the hinterland somewhere and you're running at a full run and it takes you one hour to go from one point to another point a kilometer away, your speed may be six kilometers per hour because you're running. However, your displacement is only one kilometer an hour because it took you an hour to move one kilometer away from where you started. Now the good news is all of this is related to one equation, and that is the displacement equation. Now if you start with this displacement equation, you can figure out what all of the others are. You can, you can figure out the relationship between displacement, velocity, and acceleration, and that's rather simple. So if you look at displacement over time, what you end up with is VO plus acceleration times time. This is the derivative of that equation. That is differential calculus. So basically what we did was we differentiated this top equation with respect to t, and we ended up with the bottom equation. So that's called velocity. Now, what is a change in velocity? with respect to time. That's what we call acceleration. And if we take the derivative of this second term, what we end up with 
is just acceleration. Now, believe it or not, you can continue to do this process several more times. If you do it again, you get something called jerk. If you do it again, you get snap. Then you get crackle. And then you get, you guessed it, pop. Now, to kind of give you an idea of some real-life applications of this, jerk is what you experience on a roller coaster as you're going up and you get, you get knocked to the side a little bit. It's a change in acceleration over time. These things here are important when it comes to designing things like roller coasters or railroads or embankments on highways and things like that. Now let's talk a little bit about acceleration and then we'll have a little bonus after that. Acceleration is a change in velocity, okay? Uh, an easy way of looking at acceleration is that you, if you're going along at a particular velocity, if you add a force to that and speed up, or you apply the brakes and slow down, you're changing the acceleration of that object. That's a very common way of looking at it, but that's not the only way. Another way that you can look at it is if you're going in that direction, and then all of a sudden you make a change and go in that direction, this rotation right here at a particular angle is related to rotational acceleration. Now, interestingly enough, you haven't changed the velocity of either of these vectors. However, you have accelerated the system because you changed the direction. Okay, so if you have an object that's moving along in this direction and you want it to move in that direction, the object itself, due to the fact it has mass and velocity, has something called inertia. It wants to continue on in that direction right there. In order to make it change direction by this angle, you have to apply a force to the system. So if I apply a force right here directed in that direction, it will cause this object to kind of slant off like you see there. It'll, it'll, it'll change the direction of the path. As I said, inertia wants it to continue in the same path. So even though we've got a force going in this direction, we also have what's called an apparent or a pseudo force going in the other direction, and that is the desire of the object to continue in its same direction due to something called inertia. This force is called centrifugal force. And the force that, that changes it is called centripetal force. I think that's an I in there. In any event, I'm, I'm a scientist, not a, not a writer. That's where centrifugal force comes from. It's an apparent force acting on the object to keep it going in the same direction due to inertia. And it opposes any effort to change it using a centripetal force. Now the last thing that I want to talk about is orbits and orbital mechanics because we did touch on that in the last video and I just wanted to introduce a concept. There's a thing called a Hohmann transition and it's how you transfer from one orbit to another. Say you're sitting here on a satellite. Here's the Earth right here. Okay, you're on a satellite and you're in this particular orbit around Earth, this inner orbit but you want to rendezvous with the International Space Station, which is sitting up in this orbit. Maybe you need to bring them some new supplies and some Christmas hats. How are you going to get from the inner orbit to the outer orbit? Well, the first thing that you're going to do is when you're at about this point right here, you're going to fire your rocket and apply force in that direction. And that's not really going to do too much. What it's going to end up doing is it's going to speed the satellite up a little bit, and it's going to do something like this. You're going to start leaving this inner orbit and going into an elliptical orbit, coming up here, and coming back down to there. So now what you have is you, can, you calculate this particular thrust to create an elliptical orbit that is tangent to the inner orbit here, and it's tangent to the outer orbit here. There's a couple of things to notice here. First of all, if you apply your thrust on this side, it affects the orbit on that side. If you want to immediately go into the outer orbit, 
what you're going to do is you're going to fire your rocket here at point A, and then when you get to point B, you're going to fire it again. So instead of falling back to Earth, or you know, falling back to the original orbit here, you're going to enter this orbit on the outside. And that's fine and dandy if you're just, say, launching a satellite and you want to park it in Earth orbit to make sure all the systems check out, and then you want to move it up into a geostationary orbit. Um, you know, you just go ahead and fire the rockets at point A, and then when you get up to geostationary orbit, you fire the rocket again at point B, and voila, you're in geostationary orbit. Suppose when you get ready to fire at point A, the ISS is all the way over here. What you can do is you can kind of park in this elliptical orbit until the timing's right, and then you want to make your, your second correction up here at point B when the ISS is over here. And then you can sit down and, and do a rendezvous. So you can park in that orbit for a while, and then when the time is right and the timing of the orbits is right and the position of the satellites is correct, you can go ahead and make your second burn. Now likewise, if you're in the higher orbit and you want to get down to a lower orbit, you make your initial firing here at point B, you drop down into this egg-shaped elliptical orbit. So when you fire this rocket at point B and slow down your spacecraft, you start falling back to this lower orbit, and then you come back up to point B again, and you're in an elliptical orbit. However, if you fire your rocket at point A and slow down a little bit more, you can get rid of this part and drop into this lower orbit, which is where you want to be. So again, this is an entire field of math. Uh, this is an entire field of physics. I'm giving a very brief overview on this. Notice I haven't really discussed a lot about the timing of these orbits. I haven't mentioned Kepler's laws. I haven't thrown out any differential equations. Uh, it's not that I can't do that. It's just that I don't think that it'll add a lot to the conversation at the level that I'm discussing this. This is a basic overview of how a Hohmann transition and orbits works. It's also a basic overview on scalars versus vectors. And we touched a little bit on kinematics. So this is Bob the Science Guy. Thank you very much for swinging by. I hope this um, answers some of the questions that were brought up in the last video. And I do have some more videos of Dave arguing with ChatGPT coming up, and I'll be making those in the next couple days. Take care, everyone.